What are the things to be careful about if you are exploring hard money lenders? A lot of people calculate the IRR, the internal rate of return. I don't look at appreciation. I don't look at any of that. What are the mistakes you made when you were scaling too fast? If you think that you can do everything yourself, your mindset's not right. Wheels will fall off. When you look ahead, what is it that makes more sense for short-term rentals? What conclusions have you gotten to after trying so many different asset classes? Why am I going to pay for that additional land if it's not going to cash flow? If I'm going to be buying a whole <laughs> investor, my, my number one thing is cash flow. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Hospitality Edge podcast, where we bring together what we think are two sides of the same coin, real estate and hospitality. The idea of this podcast is to bring here entrepreneurs, operators, investors, property managers, so that they can tell us about their stories, the lessons they've learned along the way, as well as some of the mistakes that they have made uh, so that you don't have to make those same mistakes on your end. Today, I'm super excited to have Anush Dada, founder at AD1 Management with us today. Thank you so much for, for being here, Anush. Uh, where are you connecting yourself from and, and how are you doing? I'm doing very well. Thank you for inviting me on and uh, to have this good conversation with you. I am based in Houston, Texas, so that's where I'm from. Houston, Texas. Lovely, lovely. All right. Well, Anuj, let's, um, be before we go into like the background story, give us, give us a quick overview of, um, you know, where you're at today with your operation at a, at a super high level, you know, what do you do for a living these days? <laughs> So I, I, uh, my company, 81 uh, Management, is a subsidiary, subsidiary of my um, other company, which is 81 Capital LLC. We are a real estate investment development uh, management company. So um, I, I buy assets um, and convert those assets into use for short-term uh, rental or long-term rental, but mostly short-term rental um, in, in the Houston market, in the Houston, Texas market. So uh, I have a mix of, uh, we've uh, about 75 listings under management. We have a mix of small multifamily and single family houses in Houston. Lovely, lovely. And um, how did you get started, man? Like what was your first uh, move into, well, let's start with real estate. Right. And then we'll talk, you know, real, real, like short term rentals in specific. But how did you get into real estate in the first place? Okay. Well, real estate, I mean, I actually started buying properties uh, when I was living in New York uh, City. That was um, probably the first property I bought. I was in, uh, in my early 20s. Um, and uh -huh. it was just a rental property. Um, and then also I had some 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 other properties that I bought in New York. I re really learned a big lesson on my early transactions where I was buying a property that was uh, occupied by, by somebody. We needed to evict this person. And in New York, the eviction laws are very tight, uh, hard to get people out. And it was a three-year process. So uh, that was a you know a long time ago. I'm about 44 now. So that was like 20 years ago. Um, and after that, I took a big hiatus from the, from the real estate business because that really put a bad taste in my mouth. Fast forward to... Um, about eight, nine years ago, I uh, bought my first uh, small multifamily property in um, in Houston, Texas, um, just as a regular long-term rental property. And then one by one, I started conver converting the units to uh, short-term rentals. So um, one by one, it was a small multifamily and we just converted, 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 and then kind of grew. So so take me to that moment when you when you bought that first uh, deal, that first multifamily deal in, in Houston. At that point, were you, uh, you know, were, were were you a were you an employee somewhere, and and you were looking for ways to sort of replace your income, or you know, what was the mindset no. behind it, and how did it how did it take place? Um, actually, it was I was um, I was coming out of a divorce actually, so I was coming out of a divorce, and um, you know, I I kind of had um, I had to invest somewhere. I had moved to Texas, uh, Houston, Texas, about six or eight months prior. Um, to this situation, and I came here to to, to buy real estate. Uh, life took some turns, delayed me a little bit, um, but you know I, I came in and, and bought the first multifamily property coming coming out of a divorce, and just um, um, started from there. Started the journey, like the second round of journey from there. Mm -hmm. Okay, and so I was I was in business in New York. Sorry, sorry to interrupt you. I was in business in New York. So uh, before I moved to Houston, I was on gas stations, subway franchises, uh, franchises, checkers franchises. So I had a good, um, you know, good involvement and good knowledge of, of how business works. Okay, so you were already 
in business. You you mm -hmm. already had had businesses in New York, so you came in already knowing that you wanted to buy real estate. Um, right. What about you know? Well, what about the short term rental piece? Like, how does that come about? Yeah, so when, when I bought my first multifamily, it was a everything was long term rental. Um, and at that time, it, you know, I had a, had an idea like I want to try short term rental. I want to try Airbnb. It was still relatively um, newer at that time. I think this was like 2016 when I had purchased. So like um, I had a plan to to build out one of my units to build out some space in, in one of the units in the apartment and and uh, make it into a, a living area. Um, so that was my plan, like six months after you know for six waiting six months after i purchased but uh one thing led to another uh, one of the tenants um uh wanted to move out early from his lease uh, from an existing unit that we had um so you know he he approached me he said hey i want to leave the lease early i said okay let's go you know check out the place i went inside the apartment and his place was furnished beautifully so i was planning on starting this like six months down the line after i did some renovations some construction in one of my um still like kind of storage units uh but this opportunity just came it was furnished fully i literally bought like three or four hundred dollars worth of like some tvs and a couple of beds and and put it on airbnb um right away and i saw the revenue come in um at that time you know there wasn't as much market saturation it was just an easier business at that point in time and i was like this is great you know the, the revenue was much better we we're doing like 3x what the long-term rental market was doing so from that point on i was like made a decision to go um convert each unit by unit as my leases came up mm -hmm. and this was at this point you have this one this one multifamily property a uh, couple of units you you test out the first one um okay and 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 do you ended up converting them all at some point correct correct so then over the next two years i ended up converting them all and i also built three more units on the property so we basically turned into i bought it as, as a six unit small multifamily property converted it um into a 10 unit multifamily property so i, I like i said i built some some new housing and i converted everything to airbnb um, you know short-term rentals so it was like a kind of like a small hotel basically you can you, you can think of it as um so i from from about 2017 until 2019 that's what i did i just you know kept it small kind of operated everything myself uh was was really kind of learning the business you know i'm um, really involved in everything um and then in 2019 i had helped a friend out um who had a house that he that he was uh, that he had fully renovated um, my friend is a builder um and he fully had he fully renovated this house it was a beautiful place but you know he had no no idea about short-term rental at that point so i said hey i'll help you out so i helped him set up the listing i helped him um, set up everything, um, you know, okay, just, just from a basis of being a friend, I didn't, I didn't charge him anything for it. And at, at about three months of him running the place, he said, this is too much for me. I got other things going on. Short term rental is not, you know, it's not a passive business by any means. Um, can you, can you manage this for me? So he approached me for management. It really wasn't on my radar too much at that point. I had met and, you know, he's a, my friend and he's a builder and my friend and my best client to this day, actually. Um, and we had randomly met actually at an open house. So that's how I met just randomly by chance at, at an open house that I was looking at some property to purchase. He was there as well. And that's when he approached me about, hey, I have this house. So I helped him out. And then, like I said, three months into it, he, he kind of said, hey, can you can you run this for me? So I said, yeah, why not? So I, that's how my kind of co-hosting journey started at that point. Um, so uh, he, he at this point from that time, that was like 2019, from that time he's built his portfolio to about 30 units, uh, all of which that I manage. And then in the meantime, from, from then till now, I, you know, I have purchased other properties for myself and, and gotten about 10 or 11 uh, more clients on board into the management. Interesting. Now, if if we go back to that first deal, and I, and I'm just talking about that w w because it it sounds like you me you mentioned it was the first you know multifamily deal, you know. So what are what are things that you learned or you wish you know you wish you had known earlier? Like if you had to redo that deal, same deal, you know, six six unit, you wanna you wanna convert to short to short term rental, you wanna you wanna increase it to ten units, but like with the knowledge that you have today. What would you have done differently, if anything? I probably would have been faster on converting the units, you know, seeing if people want to leave their leases quicker. Um, 
you know, and just had more of a kind of a st overall strategy of getting it done for the whole place, walking in with that intention, um, you know, so like maybe at, at the time of purchase, seeing if the tenants who were currently in there wanted to leave their leases, you know, seeing what their kind of feedback was, rather than, you know, I was a little bit passive about it. I just, I just waited it out, waited it out, which was fine. It worked for me what, what I needed at that point in time. Uh, but I would definitely would have expedited things more, um, you know, knowing what I Got it. And in terms of, you know, your, your investment journey, and then we'll talk about scaling the, the management portfolio, but, um, the, the properties that you acquired thereafter, did you kind of just do the same model over and over? Like, was it a rinse and repeat in terms of, okay, let me just find another six unit apartment building where I can do the same thing I just did. Or like, um, or like, was it, was it just, uh, it's you know, a mix. Different, different kind of deals, yeah, different kind of make. I mean, it's, it's a mix. Small multifamily. Every um, a, a few of them are under under ten units, and then a lot of um, single family houses with ADUs. So anything from my investment side, I'm looking for anything from two to twelve units. And the reason I keep it at that level is because I want more than one unit. I just want, you know, I don't want just one listing. I want at least at least two. And then up to 12 because it's it's much easier to manage remotely. You know, once you start getting up there into into the 20 range or so, it's it, it turns into a lot more moving parts, especially if you're running it as like a short-term rental operation, right? So uh, which which disturbs neighbors, which causes confusion for guests checking in. So I like that sweet spot right there. Like right up, um, I wouldn't go really much more than twelve units um, for for a short term rental, um, you know, multifamily. So yeah, that's that's basically what I did. I mean, sure. when when I obtain and acquire a new property, I always make sure that it cash flows on the long term rental numbers, right? Short term rental is just icing on the cake. I want to make sure that if I need to put this thing on a one year lease, somebody signs a lease that I can um, that, that that my numbers work and that the returns work for for the price that I pay. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that makes sense, and and I guess in in urban markets that that can that can make sense uh, for people that might be in, investing in in markets that are very touristic. Then it might be you know you might have to go all in into okay you know it's gonna have to cash flow as a, as an SDR because otherwise it it just won't. But at the same time, there's more risk in that approach, whereas your risk mitigate your 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 approach mitigates uh, risk a little bit more. I kind of like that. Uh, What's what's sort of been the you know the the common theme of all the properties you have found? So one is you say they cash flow as as long term rentals. Mm -hmm. um, you know you mentioned some are some are you know uh, two uh, you know two plexes all the way up to twelve. Uh, but has there been like a a common theme of of perhaps always looking for opportunities to add another unit or you know have you have you come in with a with an eye of wanting to add value and refinance at some point um or you know really just buy and hold has been your your main strategy like what's what is it that you look for as an investor when when you're looking for these deals so even if i'm like purchasing a single family i, I do look for units uh like a single family house that i can maybe build a wall somewhere so that I can make a, like a smaller unit. And then, so let's just say a three bedroom, three bathroom house. You have two bedrooms and two bathrooms on the top floor, you know, on the second floor and on the bottom floor is is a, is a separate entry for for like a one one. So I would build a wall, wall that off. So, and, and make like a studio apartment. So I, in terms of a value add to add revenue for the short term rental side, I've, I found that that has really worked for me. Um, yeah, so, so my strategy is a buy and hold strategy. Um, some of the stuff I buy with uh, mortgages in place, usually 20% down, um, you know, 80% financed. I have purchased some other places cash and then do the, uh, you know, the refinance or even with hard money as well, uh, where you, you know, you, you, you buy it with at a higher interest rate, they, they, they front you the construction money, and then you go ahead and refinance it into a, you know, fixed 30 year loan um, after you've done all the renovations. So I basically have bought two separate ways in terms of, Kind of asset type, you know, like I said, multifamily, single family, um, but also I bought new construction. I bought, you know, stuff that is renovated, like fully renovated, even though not brand new construction, but fully renovated. And then I've also bought stuff that is uh, beat up, dilapidated, that I've turned around and I've uh, done all the renovation myself, um, which always brings the most value at. 
So I like I like that approach the most um, most of the time. Now, new construction is good because there's not many maintenance issues. But you know, even if you're going fully reno- fully renovated, you know, if you do the right renovation, you're not going to have many maintenance issues as well. Um, and when you do the renovation yourself, obviously there's a bit more work in the front end. There's the construction a cash outlay, um, but you generally tend to have more equity in that property because you're building that equity yourself. That's a straight value add right there when you when you know, when you put your own. When you push mm-hmm. the appreciation of the asset, and and from having tested it all, you know, in terms of uh, the different the different types of properties you bought, new constructions, you know, properties that were already fully renovated and and whatnot. What do you? What do you? I don't know if the question is what do you like the most, but like, yeah, like yeah, now well, when, when you're when you're looking at buying more properties at the moment. Like or when you look ahead, what is what is it that you find makes more sense for, you know, for short term rentals for 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 your you know investor profile for your risk profile? Like what 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 conclusions have you gotten to after trying so many different asset classes? Okay, cool. That's a good question. So for me, I like the. Um... Uh, beat up properties that I can renovate and and customize and put them on the short term rental market. Um, that's for my own investment portfolio. That's that's the direction that I'm going with all my assets. That so that's what you would typically buy on on like a hard money loan. Will they will they give you you know a certain percentage of the purchase price, like ninety percent plus construction money as well, and at at a higher interest rate for a shorter amount of time. Then once you renovate it, refinance it, put it put it into cash flow. Then you go ahead. Then you go ahead and, and refinance the the, um, the property. Now, for in for for clients, for example, I, I you know if unless they have the appetite to do something like this, what I would tell them what what I do is find properties for them that are newer construction or like already fully renovated, because and the benefit on that is you you get to cash flow quicker, right? If you have a brand new construction property ready to go, within twenty to thirty days, you can have that thing fully furnished on the market, you're making money right away. Whereas typically if you're doing a renovation, it's gonna run you about six months to get everything done, get the permits in place, get everything going, renovate the place. You know, so if you're looking to be in cash quicker, so if one of my clients is, you know, um, has a full-time job, this is, you know, they hire me because um, we, t- we handle everything, we take care of everything. Their objective is to be in, in cash flow quick rather than laying out money, laying out money, laying out money. So, um, you know, it really depends on, what your goal is. So for me, on my personal investment side, I like to uh, buy the beat up properties, usually with hard money, and then do the refinance once everything is completed. Um, and depending on the client profile, typically put them in newer construction stuff that is already ready to go where it just needs to be, you know, first. Mm-hmm. Let's talk a little bit about that approach of, of going and, and, and getting a, a hard money lender uh, because it's a beat up property and whatnot. There's, uh, you know, there's risks, right? There's pros and cons, like anything. But, 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 uh, you know, primarily is because the the bank won't won't finance that property if it's all beat up, right? Or 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 the the loan amount is going to be too little. So that's where you go into these alternative uh, lending sources. What are the do's and don'ts? Like, what are the things to be to be careful about if you if you are uh, exploring? hard money lenders and, and, and how have you, you know, how have you most successfully structured those kind of, uh, those kind of deals for it to make sense for you and, and also mitigate risks on your end? I personally, personally like to do a full gut renovation. Now, if you can buy a property, you know, find a property that is you know, you only need some superficial renovation. You don't got to worry about the plumbing. You don't got to worry about the uh, electrical. You don't got to worry about the ACs. That's great. Um, you're not going to find too many of those deals, but if you can, that's good. And a lot of times you can get something like that financed through a bank. You don't need a, a non-traditional lender. So really, I, what, what I'm looking for is something where the foundation um, is minimal work. You know, there's usually some work in the foundations, especially when it's sitting on pier and beam in Houston. We have a lot of pier and beam, not the not, not the concrete slabs. So, um, um, so you know, you got to see how much foundation work there is, um, and then also what's the roof condition, right? Those are two main things. And then other than that, where's the value add? Where where can, do I have space to add a bathroom? 
that's a very important thing. Do I have an area where I can make an exterior entrance? You know, so that that way, if, so I can make multiple units out of this property. You know, if you, even if it's a single family house, I can I can add a wall, add an exterior entrance, add a bathroom. Now I just made another unit. And for short term rental, it works. You don't even necessarily need a kitchen. You know, you just need like a little hotel type of room. Um, so yeah, that's what I like to do a full gut renovation because a lot of times the houses are older. So you want to open up the walls. You want to get into the framing. You want to see what's going on. And if you're going to add things like bathrooms, you need to add additional plumbing. You have to run more pipes, water pipes, sewer pipes, all of these different um, things. So that's what I look for. So for real, for, for the main thing is what I like to do is buy small square footage on the land side. So if you give me a, the same square foot house, let's just say, for example, a thousand square foot house on a 2,500 square foot lot, and you give me a thousand square foot house on a 5,000 square foot and my, I don't have a plan to build another unit on that house or ADU or anything, then I'm going to always want to take the house that's a, uh, that's on the 2,500 square foot lot. Because why am I going to pay for that additional land if it's not going to cash flow for me? If I'm going to be buying a whole investor, my, my number one thing is cash flow. So if I can buy something at a cheaper price, you know, and, you know, they say it's an old saying that your money is made in real estate on the buy side. It's very true. So, you know, if you can buy it at, at, at a cheaper price and you know your land value is there, um, but if you can buy it a smaller piece, but the same size um, building, then you're going to maximize your cash flow because up front, you're going to pay less for that cash. Now, when you're less for that property. Now, obviously, when you're selling it on, on, on the back end, that'll have the effect there as well. But if you have a, a nice grade A asset that's cash flowing beautifully, then, you know, you, you, you have you have some room to make up some um, some some equity with that type of asset. So that, that's really what I'm looking for when I'm when, when I'm buying less land, more building on the same. Property. Interesting. Yeah, Provi provided that that the less land is cheaper, of course, so that you actually can, to your point, cash flow cash flow more. Because I, I would assume, like, if it's two, if the two are the same and one has more land, then you'd go with the if if they're the same price, then you would then go with the, go with one. The yeah, yeah, yeah. With the, with the bigger it. piece, but yeah, right. But the assumption is less land is going to have, uh, you know, a, a less. It's going to cause less. Got it, got it. And as you're as you're going through all of this, you know, you 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 meet this guy at an open house, and and then he becomes. You start working together, and and he starts growing his side of of of, of the portfolio, which you start managing. Walk walk me through the the timeline of scaling your property management operation, like. If you if you were to uh, break it down into stages of growth, have you felt such a thing as like okay, I just I just hit another level. Like you know, having having ten properties was something, but as the moment that I went from ten to 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 thirty, I really had to you know shift gears. Like what what yeah. have been those stages of growth for you, and what ha what are the changes that have come with that? I would say the first kind of phase of growth was, well, the first is when I just had my apartment complex, not not managing oh. anybody else's. Really learned the bones of the business in that way because I was handling every single thing, even cleaning it sometimes. You know, when I didn't have somebody to clean, I would clean myself. So I really learned uh, the real uh, mechanics of this business at that time. So let, let's just call that kind of phase one. Then I then I met, um, you know, I met my, uh, my friend and client, the builder, and he um, brought on one property and he was, he worked on many projects. He, he worked very quickly. So I think within a year on, on his portfolio, we must have had about seven or eight properties. Just. So up until about 20 properties, up until about 20 listings. So let's just say we started in 2017, up until about um, at, right after COVID uh, kind of came, like let's just say May or so, uh, April or May of, of 2020. Um, we were up to about 20 listings where I was handling everything myself. I had my cleaning team. I had some cleaners, so I wasn't really cleaning as much. But I was all the guest communication, all the back-end business operations, all the listing updates, obviously the revenue management, all of those aspects of the business, I was handling myself. I didn't have any employees except for the people who were cleaning for me. Um, and then in 20, right after COVID, um, around May, May of 2020, I hired my first uh, VA out of the Philippines. So if you want to talk, maybe like that's the next phase, right? So then that starts the next phase where it's like, okay, 
once you hire one, then you know, then you're more freed up to, to like use your energy in different ways to, to talk, talk to more people to get clientele to um, you know focus on your own um, projects and, and things like this. So from from that time until now, um, you know, we grew from about twenty to where uh, about seventy five right now. So I, you know, I, I had colleagues in this business when this business was really hot in like 2021 post COVID, where the numbers were just insanely ridiculous. Revenue numbers were, were high for everybody. Um, I, I, you know, I had colleagues and people that I knew that really grew fast, really, really fast. Now, I didn't go that route. I, I like to I like to keep my sanity. I liked it slow and steady. I took on a new clientele. I like to have as much as I can handle on the operation side. So as we grew. Um, operationally, um, you know, we, 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 we kept our numbers, we kept our quality really good. Always. That was the number one focus for me. And the people that I known who grew really fast, kind of in, in a boom type of, because the market was booming, they're the same people who kind of had to scale down a lot as well. Whereas for me, it's always just, it's, it's always just been steady growth. That's what, that's, that's what's always worked for me. So. You know, I was um, up until about, uh, you know, last year. So from, from the time period of like post-COVID 2020 to let's just say 2022 was a boom time for everybody. So that's when I we grew to about 50 or 55 listings from like 20 to about 55, hired more people on the VA side, formalized a real kind of operations team for the business by this time. And then um, I would say starting 2023, uh, up until kind of present time, we, you know, we've grown about 20 more listings. So those are, I would say it's like been a four or five phases of, of the growth of this business. Uh, what, uh, what I appreciate is that we've been able to keep it slow and steady. We've been ke- able to keep our operations tight, keep our numbers good, keep the revenue good, um, and keep our, our clients happy. Uh, we have no, we really don't have any churn, hardly any churn. So we're not really losing clients, um, ever um you know just i can count maybe just a couple um and we're just growing 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 and and you know um thankful for that. where where would you say that mindset comes from in terms of you know not not going crazy with growth but rather doing so at a steady steady pace like where does that mindset come from and how do you find the discipline to life lessons to, to life lessons so? yeah life lessons in my previous life when I was uh, living in New York, operating gas stations, um, you know, at some point I had about 20 gas stations. I had about you know, 15 subway franchises and um, we really grew fast, too fast to handle in some cases, whereas kind of the wheels come falling off. So and, you know, when you're younger, your ambition is there and you want to, you know, bite off everything. You say yes to everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go, go, go. But then you realize, you know, if your management is not in place and your operations are not tight, you know, the wheels fall. And 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 I I went through some of those type of experiences in my in in my business life, and I said, okay, when I when I redo something and when I rebuild a business, I'm going to keep it. And my and my one simple rule is I want I need to keep my sanity as long as I keep my sanity and like everything is uh, steady that I can handle and have my quality right. And, and and the numbers are good, then I'll be happy with that. And that's and that's the approach I took on the second time around. So definitely for life experience. Now, how do you put that in practice? Because the mindset is great, like keeping your sanity, right? And then the day to day comes in, the craziness of the of the operation kicks in. You know, you have you have uh, things going on left and right. How do you keep your sanity? I have a great team. So we have a great team on, on state side in Houston. We have about uh, 12 people on our operations team. I have a great uh, uh, chief operations officer, COO. Uh, I have a great CFO. So um, just having the right team around you, the right leadership within the business is very important. Um, I have a great team um, on internationally in the Philippines uh, where we, you know, we have our VAs, but our VAs, our business is broken up into, into three different departments. You have communications, you have finance, and you have operations, and operations includes maintenance. So having the kind of division of the business, and then and and um, and every department having their their responsibilities, and the people within those departments having their leadership roles, 
all of this stuff is what it's about. At the end of the day, I mean, we just manage labor. We don't really sell a product, right? We don't sell a good, we sell a service, but really we, we you know, that's that's what I do all day. We just manage labor. So that's that's how we do it. With scaling and with growth, you got to have the right team. And, and, and that's what it's all about. And in terms of your team, when, when uh, like, what comes in first, your CFO, your COO, like, do they, like, at what point yeah. do, you, do you start bringing, like, C-suite level uh, executives to, C- your, to your stuff? Right. So my, so my CEO that I presently have was hired, like, last year, but I, I, I initially started that position within my company um, about what, two, two and a half years ago. So, you know, that's when, that was the first thing, chief operations, like operations is the number one thing in this business. That's the first thing that I needed help with, boots on the ground, making sure that operations are tight. You know, um, I was still running, uh, run the communication side of the business. Uh, I was still running, obviously, revenue management and, and finance. Finance is the accounting, the invoicing, you know, we have a lot of reimbursements, a lot of back and forth. So I was doing all of that. But the first person that I needed to hire and take off of my hands was the operation side of the business. So, so that was the first C-suite person. Then after that, once we started going, growing with clientele um, and management, um, I, I hired a, a finance manager who uh, he was leading the department, and then I eventually made him CFO of the company. And you know, he he oversees everybody. But you know, we we make monthly reports for our clients, monthly detailed revenue and occupancy reports that are that we curate in house and we send to our clients. Uh, we have a lot of reimbursements in this business. Things break, this happens, that happens. So we need to make sure that we're getting. You know, if we buy a microwave or a listing, we need to make sure that we're getting reimbursed for that item. You know, so a lot of that back and forth, um, you know, CFO is is good for kind of overseeing all of that. And, and, and the, you know, the invoicing is super important that your invoicing is correct. You know, everything is congruent, everything makes sense because you, you don't, you know, you can't just invoice customers and not give them any reasoning behind it, you know? So our invoicing is, is on QuickBooks, it's done meticulously, and we back up everything. So if, for example, you know, we, we also do maintenance in-house. So so another piece of this business that I kind of grew was I just in-house everything. So uh, so we so we do landscaping in-house, we do maintenance in-house, we do extermination in-house. So basically we're a one-stop shop to service our clients for anything that they need. Um, therefore they have no they have no headaches and they have no reason to, to get any third party vendors. Um, and if there is a third party needed, like a plumber or somebody, we arrange that. We get everything done. So, mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. yeah. Got it. Yeah. Got it. Now, tell me something, because, you know, you said that the the way the way in which you're able to maintain your sanity is by having a good team. You mentioned that before, when you when you scaled very fast in, in the past, uh, you know that 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 was perhaps a little bit too fast. When it comes to the talent management side of things, what are things that or mistakes mistakes you made when you were scaling too fast that that now you're being very careful to not make again when it comes to your team, whether whether hiring or or managing, what would that be? Well, the mistakes that I made in the past, I would say, is think think that you can do everything yourself. You know, mm-hmm. if you if you think that you can do everything yourself, then then you know your like your mindset's not right because the wheels will fall off. So that's one one modification that I made. Like you know, at a certain point you can do things yourself, but then you you can't just keep picking things up when your plate is already full. It's it's uh you know it's it's very hard to to manage that. So I would do that. Um, in terms of staffing and 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 hiring people, like we do have a tight team. It's not a huge team. We have a total of about twenty five people. So um, a lot of it, like on the on the cleaning side, on the operations team, um, you know, our cleaners, a lot of them are just from in house. Like one person knows another person, and we kind of just have a have a good kind of um, pool of cleaners that 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 we can choose from. Um, some of it's luck, man. Like my CEO, who's an amazing person, and he really is a great leader in the team. Uh, he's CEO and president just kind of fell in my lap. I mean, just, just, just came in. Um, his, his, his wife got hired with us as a, as a cleaner. She's like, Hey, my husband's looking for a job as well. And came in and, and, and he was just 
great, you know, just great. And, and I, we saw the potential in him and, and he, he came up strong. My CFO also, he was a cleaner with us. He started as a cleaner. He, he, you know, he's an immigrant from, from Mexico. So, you know, he's an accountant over there, had a, had a good job with like, uh, I think Nestle, um, uh, working on the accounting side, but obviously you come over here to, to the States, there's a, you know, it, you can't pick up those jobs necessarily right away. So he started, he needed um, extra kind of weekend, weekend work. Um, so we, so we hired him in as a cleaner and uh, obviously learned about what his real skills are. And, mm -hmm. and then in time, yeah, and then in time, you know, uh, because it wasn't with us full time, just part time. But in in time, he basically was letting uh, leaving his other office job that he had, and I said, "Come on over, work with us full time in the office, and and you know, come come and head our finance department." And that's what he did. And uh, and yeah, so really, uh, a lot of our growth is internally, and I believe the same thing. Like now, I like to hire from the bottom up. So like, I'd rather hire a new cleaner to come in and bump up people that are internal, you know, um, that's mm -hmm. the way that, I, yeah. that I've done. I mean, it. they've uh, learned their business from the ground up and, and, and it's, it's, I think that's an interesting lesson in, in just, just shows that the, the way you treat your team, the quality, like your quality as a leader, you know, the, the impact that it can have, cause you never know, right? Like you never know who, who it is that you're dealing with and, and, and what it is that their true potential might might end up becoming. It's okay if you know they 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 remain a cleaner forever. That that's totally fine. But 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 it's I think it's a beautiful story to know that you know some of your leaders actually started there and, and you had the vision to see to see more potential in them. And I'm sure that you know if 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 you saw it in them, they, they also saw something in you as a leader that you know encouraged them to to wanna want to show those traits, want to show those skills. And so that's, that's very interesting. Now, what's your, you know, what's your strategic focus when you look ahead? I mean, are you trying to grow more the management piece? Are you trying to, to grow more the, the real estate acquisition piece? Like what's, Both. what's, Both. what's next for you? Yeah. 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 I mean, yeah, for, for me, for sure. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm always, you know, looking for the deals to buy for myself, to acquire more assets at the end of the day, you know the, the the management side is good. It's a good cash flow business, so you can you can build it and build the value of the business by building more clientele. Um, so I'm growing kind of both both legs of the business, right? The, picking up more clientele, or I like like I, I I like getting new clients. It's great, but a lot of the clients that I have are 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 builders, are people who are in the business, so they just naturally bring more properties because they're growing growing their own portfolio. I like mm -hmm. that. I like that because you don't have, you know, you don't necessarily have to deal with more people. You can have more assets, you can have more properties, but you don't necessarily have to deal with more people on the management side. You know, managing clients is a big part of the business as well. That's something that I, that I do myself along with my CEO. Um, so, so yeah, on the management side, you know, I'm definitely growing that angle of the business and really, I mean, at the end of the day, you know, this business is a beast. Operationally, short-term rental, when your average bookings are like two nights, it's a beast. It, you know, it's it's a hospitality business. You got to make sure things are right. So at some point, I would probably want to grow the management side and sell the management business when when the, when the time is right. Um, and in the meanwhile, I'll grow my own real estate portfolio, grow, grow my own assets. Um, I'm really doing everything myself in terms of what I'm purchasing because I have the apparatus in place. I have the company in place that can manage and operate everything. So unless I need a, uh, like partners for, for financial reasons or something like that, I really just look to purchase assets myself and grow my own, own kind of person. And, and, and with, the with the times that have changed since you bought your first property, uh, whether whether we're talking uh, the saturation, you know, quote unquote, of the market, like the the, the increase in supply that there is out there, uh, especially compared to the to the rate of like the the rate of growth of supply has been definitely faster than the than the rate of growth of demand, and then you know interest rates and whatnot. Like, what's what has shifted in the way that you look for deals or in the way that you have to on the right your deals or 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 even finance your deals like what what has changed 
in 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 the deals that you might be looking at right now in your pipeline versus versus very when you first were uh making some acquisitions when i was really first starting to acquire which was like uh well i made my first acquisition like the, like the rates were lower right so it's easier to underwrite deals so it's like numbers mm -hmm. just made sense so like and prices pre-COVID prices were not as high. Right? Prices really got elevated when they lowered the rates a lot, a lot post-COVID, and then asset prices all inflated. But deals were still easy to underwrite at that point in time, then because the rates were so low and things were still cash flowing, and those were like the golden times. So, I would say underwriting deals was when I initially initially got in, like pre-COVID, it was you know the rates were were I think you know. And in the fives or so, I think you were probably purchasing in, in, in the five percent range. So, you know, that you know that with, with that in place, it was it was much easier. The numbers worked. It was easier to underwrite deals. Um, also, that was you know, if you're thinking about short term rental, um, in the in the early days, you can just put a bed and like a TV and like in a place and like a sofa and like you'll have customers, you'll have good reviews. You'll have, you know, you'll have a business, you know, as long as you run it that way. You don't have to be fancy with your design. You don't have to put a lot of thought into it. You could just really do it. And people, because it was just, a, you know, it was just the early days. Um, now it's a completely different ballgame. Uh, from, from the OTA side, Airbnb is the major OTA, right? We use other OTAs as well. We do direct booking as well. But Airbnb is still the major OTA. And Airbnb has gotten much more stringent on their guidelines in terms of, um guest reviews and you know uh they they've kicked a lot of listings off so your quality has to be right your operations have to be right your design now has to be on point because if it's not mm -hmm. and you're just kind of plain jane it's not you know you're going to get beat up and you're not going to be able to, uh, to to sell the listing at the price just for some simple minor things paint um, you know, the right artwork, you know, a couple of amenities, you, you can just do that the right way. Your ADRs, your rev car is going to go way up. So you, you got to make sure your design is right. You got to make sure your operations are right. Um, so, so it was like a wave in terms of acquisition side, meaning like initially got in rates are kind of in the fives or so, right? Pre COVID. Um, uh, but and even lower on the single family side, you know, you were getting rates pre COVID in the threes. 30 year fix, you were getting three, four percent. Um, and then COVID hits, and then it's a bonanza because people are buying assets. There's there's uh, you know, after COVID, I mean, right? Because rates became so low. People people are buying assets, you know, everybody uh, thinks they're gonna be rich in real estate because rates are so low. Um, and you're able to cash flow a lot of deals, you know, like number things made sense on paper when your rates are in the two, three percent range. Things make a lot of sense on paper. So, so, you know, that's what happened, um, on, on that, on that angle. And then I think, you know, the rates started rising, I like think last quarter, 2022 into 2023, rates started going up and that kind of stagnated the market a little bit, you know, and it's always the inverse relationship when, when, when rates go up, asset values go down, when, when rates go down, asset values go up. So, um, you know, now I see rates are starting to go down again now presently, but really what it's been like in the last couple of years is um you got to make sure that you're buying right you got to make sure that your purchase is right you got to make sure that on the back end that your that your uh, rent is going to cover whatever that rate is going to be so if you're buying on the commercial side um or if you know if you're buying under a, under a company name then you're borrowing you you've been borrowing at like 8 9% so your numbers really got to work that means on the buy side up front you got to make sure that you're buying right you really got to make sure um because otherwise how you how are you going to pay your mortgage you're not going to be able to pay your mortgage so underwriting mm -hmm. I, there's a, and, and there's been a lot of deals that i look at that are potential new clients potential new acquisitions that i say no to because if the numbers don't work i don't i want people to be happy at the end of the day so if a client client who brings me a property and says hey i want to put this on or i want to acquire this property i want to put it on either long term or short term i run the numbers and the numbers don't work i won't i won't take it on because I don't want to have headaches down the line. We want, you know, I want to take mm -hmm. the properties that I'm coming. Now, when when you have a situation where, to your point, uh, you know the the it's it's harder for for the numbers to pencil out, but maybe the the sellers haven't yet 
made made their mind around the fact that you know the prices need to need to adjust. So you're 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 looking you're looking at a lot of properties that just don't cash flow, right? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. You know, there's you can you can run the numbers very conservatively and see that they don't they don't work, and then decide not to go through. Or you can look at the potential of the deal and 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 you know kind of go based on that, and then and then hope that that potential actually ends up realizing itself. And then then and then most of the, most of the times it's probably somewhere in the middle. Like you you're running a few stress tests and you're and you're looking at how comfortable you are with the different scenarios. What do you normally recommend in terms of drawing the line on on that analysis? Like when when a client comes to you and is asking you, hey, should I buy this property? Is it is it for you like as simple as look you know with the rate you know the long term rent would not cover the mortgage that's it that's all just don't look at it any further or do you also you know go a little bit into the upside potential that the deal might have yeah so if the long term rental numbers are like a break even after paying the mortgage then it's something worth exploring. It's, it's, it's worth looking into. Uh, I'm usually looking for a cash on cash return. I mean, 10% is great. Um, if we can get 10%, I mean, when the rates were really low, I was looking at 15%. So, so but right now, if I can work on a cash on cash of like eight to 10%, uh, it's, it's, it's a deal that I would, I would give a green light to. Um, so that's kind of the, kind of what my criteria is um, for, 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 for buying. And that's on the long-term hold side, you know, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Eight, eight to ten percent okay. cash on cash return. Okay, so you mainly look at it from a from a cash on cash return perspective. Have you done any uh, seller financing? I bought I bought a piece of land seller financed. Um, so yeah, just some land stuff I've done seller financed um, that that I purchased, but. Other than that, I, I haven't. Seller finance can work too. Now there's now there's different types of debt as well, right? So what we've been talking about from a cash on cash eight to ten percent is is a principal interest payment. But if you get an IO payment, like so, I've done a seller a, a seller finance deal where I bought a piece of land and it was a two year fixed interest only payment at like eight or nine percent. So you know then the, then the numbers work because you have time. You're, you're not paying down your principal, obviously, but you're but you're paying down your uh, your um, you know you're you're just holding it and you're paying the interest, which keeps your carrying costs lower. So sometimes that type of deal is going to work. And then that way, if you're if you're playing the game of appreciation, then you can say, okay, I can refinance the, this thing down the line, um, and and I've I've only paid the interest and I'll have the equity built because of the appreciation. Personally speaking, though, I don't play the appreciation game. Um, I let the appreciation take take care of itself, and that's fine. Um, but I play the cash flow. I got to make sure that my numbers are cash flowing right. But if, if they if they can break even with the mortgage on the long term rental side, then I know I have some upside on on the short term rental um, side and and convert that asset into a short. Interesting, interesting. And 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 and. Was there a point when you when you made that conclusion that, that you don't play the appreciation game and you just want to look at the cash flow game, or was that always yeah, kind of in, it's in, always in, been a in thing. your mind? Mm -hmm. It's always been for me that I mean, obviously, you want to buy in neighborhoods which you think are appreciating, right? But mm -hmm. you don't factor. You know, you have certain ways to to calculate return, right? A lot of people calculate the IRR, the internal rate of return. Mm -hmm. Right. So which is appreciation, equity, pay down and cash flow. It's a combination of the three. And then, you know, so if you're if somebody's looking into a syndication deal, they're always going to be marketing the IRR. Um in this in, in, in this case, I don't I don't look at I don't look at that. I don't look at appreciation. I don't look at any of that. Um because if you're a buy and hold why? Is it just a way to be more conservative? Is it, a is way it... to be oh, oh, yeah, because I'm a buy and hold investor. I'm not really looking to sell. If I sell and there's and there's appreciation uh, on the on the sale. Great, that's just mm -hmm. extra gravy, right? Uh, but my always my intention is to buy and hold and really not sell. Um, I have mm -hmm. no intention to sell assets, so I look at it, you know, from that lens. Otherwise, yeah. Otherwise, you can be fooling yourself into thinking this is a great deal because the I in the internal rate of return looks great, but it's only because of the the proceeds of of the sale, right? Right, and you can and you can realize the equity on the appreciation without selling, right? To 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 refining, so you know, which I've done. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Where do you think the industry is at, uh, Anuj, uh, at a high level? Like, do you see opportunities uh, for you uh, as far as an operator goes in, in, in expanding into new markets? Do you think, uh, you know, there's a lot of talk about uh, flexible, flexible accommodations, like mixing short term with mid term with long term into a same asset? Uh, like what are the big trends that yeah. you see that you're trying to capitalize on looking ahead? I do have, I do have assets that are mixed. So like one property will have a couple of units that are long-term and a couple of units that are short-term. I think it's a good strategy because it's, it mitigates some risk. You know, you have some guaranteed rents coming in the door. Uh, you, you don't have any seasonality to worry about, you know, things like that. So I think that can work. Midterm rental is a tricky game. I know it's a hot topic. Everybody talks about midterm rental um as a as as a type of of way to get uh, income it's very inconsistent from my experience it's very very inconsistent you know unless you're you're putting your property out on airbnb booking.com vrbo whatever and yeah a certain percentage of bookings are going to be you know 15 30 45 60 days plus bookings you're going to get some of those which are great when they come but you know it's it's pretty inconsistent from my experience what is consistent is those two, three, four night bookings and obviously the long term rental. So if I was going to, you know, that's why I have a mix of like long term and short term. And when midterm comes, great, midterm comes. Sometimes an insurance company, relocation company is going to reach out to you and you'll get that clientele. Now I do, I you know, I do know people who are, who are, uh, worked into in, into with the insurance companies and some of them get, you know, they their their houses are listed and we obviously have some assets listed on, on insurance company websites as well, the like the relocation companies as well. Um mm -hmm. but it's it's not consistent. I, I in my opinion you can't you can't rely on mid term rental prices. Um so yeah, I, I think I, I think a mixture is probably um a good way to go. Now, regulation aside, right, because every regulation is local, so that if we can't really talk about regulation, because some cities are going to have higher regulations than others. So putting that all aside, um, if you're just talking from a straight business standpoint, I mean, what I see what's happening in this business is a neighbor relations are, are very, very important. Neighbor relations are super important. So you need to make sure that you're good with your neighbors. You need to make sure that you're a responsible operator. Uh, because having clashing with neighbors is not a good look for you in this business. So you need to make sure that you're on their side. You need to make sure that they have a good contact number that they can reach at any time. Uh, we actually even have security patrol that runs our properties on Friday and Saturday nights, just in case parties pop off. We have a security patrol that is driving around for about three, four hours on Friday, Saturday nights. Neighbors have access to our VAs at all times, so they can call them at any time and say, hey, there's something going on over here. So, you know, we want to be an advocate for the neighbor um, and because and, we want to make sure that, that, that we're doing that right. Because um, that's how you can have longevity in the business. You can, you can have Interesting. You give, you give your neighbors... The, the contact details of your of your communications team so that if they right. spot something right. they can they can reach out to them right away yeah exactly exactly so I would say neighbor relations I I, I would say design we, we touched on a little bit design is very important to kind of stand out have have unique uh unique design you know unique amenities now obviously there's a high end luxury properties people have pickleball courts they have bowling alleys in their listings and things like this. That's cool. Those are the high-end luxuries, so that's a different segment. I, I come more from the standpoint of like normal houses, normal apartments, you know, not with all of that over-the-top stuff. And I think a majority of the operators are in that realm. You know, some people may have pools and stuff, but like in the realm of like kind of a, more of a normal accommodation, but you want to have the right design in that place. And then the other aspect is the operations, because not only are guest expectations higher, Right, uh, guests have very high expectations. From the time when I first started in this business, it was it was great because the expectations were very low. People were friendly. People were they were not, they wanted to like, you know, it was like a cool thing. You know, 2017, right? It was like a cool thing. It was like, oh, everybody's different, you know. Um, so the expectations of the of the guests at that time was like we're all friends we're all cool now it's like especially when you're coming from the standpoint of a hospitality management company they have very high expectations for you like you have to be run like a hotel 
and, and sometimes even more efficiently just because it's like you know you're you things happen you need to be able to respond very very quickly just like if somebody was staying in a hotel after hours anytime you need to be able to respond so 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 the operation side cleanliness you know back in the day you could just have, as long as your place was pretty clean you had clean sheets clean towels you'll be all right now it's like your baseboards better be clean you better have like a hundred point checklist you got you better make sure that your operations are tight so that you got your your guest expectations to manage and then aside from that is the ota expectations now direct booking is great um and i think some people do a lot of direct booking our direct booking mix is probably about 10 percent um, and growing but it's about 10 percent vrbo is about 15 percent booking.com is about 10 percent and then the rest is airbnb Airbnb has gotten much more stringent on their guidelines on what they're doing for listings. So now it used to be that you can have like, uh, as long as you're, you're averaging, like, I think it was above like 80, 85% five star and you had a one-off one star here and there, nobody bothered. Airbnb didn't bother you. It was all good. Now, if you have a one star, you will go on listing issues under Airbnb. And now, you know, if that happens again, then they'll suspend your listing. So there's a lot more pressure from the OTA side in terms of the quality. So not only is it from the guest side and from the OTA side, plus the guest knows this. So the guest knows they can always reach out to the OTA. And, you know, and the OTA is with Airbnb, they're very, before they were pro host when they needed supply. Now they have so much supply, they don't care. They're pro guests because it's like the supply is there already. So the hosts are expendable. And from Airbnb standpoint, they'd rather, I think from Airbnb standpoint, they'd rather have a hundred thousand hosts with a million listings that they would rather have a, like a million hosts with a million listings than a hundred thousand hosts with a million listings. If, if you follow what I'm saying, you know, because they don't care. The supply, supply is there. So I think, I think those are the changes. And the quality aspect is crucial. And there's a lot of, there's a lot of operators that argue that the 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 rating system is unfair for larger operators because you know the moment you have one bad review it's going to affect your your entire averages and the odds are quote unquote against you the more the more properties you have how have you managed i mean it, we we touched on it but to 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 keep that that quality as you have as you've added more and more properties especially as the expectations have gotten more strict and more strict and whatnot like what's what's the thing for you is it checklists is it just you know like you said earlier the team uh is it the i don't know like random inspections all of the above yeah all of the above actually all of the above checklists quality of people you know if, if you if you're seeing not good quality work for somebody don't keep that person around too long you need to you need to keep it moving because you, and, and, and another thing about the people is having longevity of time, having loyalty and longevity of time, because once they're in it and they're with you for longer, they understand what the properties are like, right? Rather than if you're changing cleaners all the time, they don't have a feel for what the property is. So if you, if you have that loyal people working for you who've been, been with you for a long time, that's a very important thing. And yes, inspections as well. Inspections are another huge thing where, you know, you go in behind and not every time, but we have monthly inspections. We have sometimes biweekly inspections. Another big thing is real-time response. I don't even just mean from the communication side, but I mean, for example, you know, not people are not perfect, right? Systems are not perfect, right? So you need to be able to I don't know, like a hairdryer is missing, right? Let's just say a cleaner was in there and they, they somebody, the previous guest broke or stole the hairdryer. It's happened before. And and and, and the, the hairdryer is missing. And now the guest checks in, the new guest checks in and the cleaner never caught it. It never got caught. So we did never replace the hairdryer. Now a person checks in, they're like, I need a hairdryer. Where's my hairdryer? You know, it's supposed to be a hairdryer here. Well, now the ability to respond to that real time and get that hair dryer to them is very, very important. Mm -hmm. Some things you can wait till the next day. Some things need to be handled immediately. You know, sometimes a cleaner doesn't doesn't do the right job on the cleaning, right? You know, like if a sheet's have had to be changed, for some reason there's a stain on the sheet. You know, it happens. It happens in five star hotels that I've seen. I've seen it at a personal. There's a stain on the sheet. 
can you get somebody there to change those sheets up? Right? That that requires like an immediate response, you know. Something like a hair dryer can be like a, a next day or you know something like that. So it, it depends, but you got to have the ability to be adaptable to those situations and be amenable to those situations, so that because that saves a review. That's literally saves a review. A bad review coming in versus you. Somebody goes there and drops off a hair dryer or something like this has a personable experience knows that somebody else on the other like cares and they're there to, to, to like handle it boom that you just took a two star and made it a five star so it's very that's a, i i think it's a great point to uh, you know as, as far as like closing thoughts go like every thing that happens throughout the guest's experience is an opportunity to turn things around like positive or yes. not i mean i've even had operators in here telling me like as much as i like guests where nothing goes wrong and, and and the experience goes perfectly, like it it doesn't let us show what we're capable of. So I think that's the kind of mindset that this environment requires us to have. Otherwise, yeah. you're gonna go crazy. <laughs> it's always it's always about guest experience. That's the number one thing that you you know bring up a good point. Guest experience is the name of this game one hundred percent. So you know, mm -hmm. that's what we got to focus on. That's what our focus always has to be, guest experience. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. All right. Well, listen, Anuj, uh, I could keep you here for hours. It's been super fun. Uh, I really appreciate your yeah, time appreciate and your it. insights. Um, yeah, where can people uh, connect, man, and stay in touch? Uh, so our Instagram is at 81management. Um, so that's AD, uh, the letters AD1 in the word management. Um, the website is uh, at, uh, sorry, is 81mgmt.com. It's 81mgmt.com. Uh, we, we operate all, all our listings out of Houston. Uh, we do, you know, work through our Texas as well. So hit us up uh, for, for whatever the, that's our connects. That's a social and, uh, and it's a website. Awesome. Thank you so much, Anush. Really appreciate the all chat. Right. All right, Sebastian, be well, man. Take care so much. All right, Bye. take care.